Hi guys, today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible's offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download the title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese. Also, a huge special thanks to our patrons at Patreon. Our current patrons are John Donna, Stephanie L, Terry Needleman, and Max Lunig. They give us a little extra financial support that helps keep the lights on here at Musicals with Cheese. If you would like to join them in supporting us, you can get tons of fun perks such as patron-only commentaries. We just did one on The Music Man. It's available for us now, and you previously did one on Cats that you could finally get able access to. Just go on there. Or you'll also get our episodes a day early, or even earlier if you come on to Patreon. Do you want to talk about our Amazon affiliate link, Andrew? Sure, I'll do a brief talk about our Amazon affiliate link. Look, if you don't have the extra money to support our Patreon or whatever, that's fine. But... If you're going to buy something on Amazon and you want to support us with no extra cost to yourself, just click the Amazon affiliate link in the description before you buy, and we will get a portion of whatever you spend. You don't have to spend any extra, um, just have to click the link. So it's free. Free! All right, let's get on to the real show. Hello, I'm Jesse McAnally. And I'm Andrew DeWolf. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew to like musical theater more. How are you today, Andrew? Oh, it looks like them boys have gotten themselves into some trouble. (laughs) 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 Sounds like we're in the South. Oh, way down South where it gets real hot. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Andrew, what are we talking about today? Um, Well, in honor of Confederate Memorial Day, we're reviewing Parade. Parade is a musical with a book and by Alfred Urey and music and lyrics by our favorite um, head of the Jason Robert Brown fan club, Jason Robert Brown. You you stole that joke and you will never stop using it, will you? <laughs> never. The musical premiered on Broadway in 1998 and won Tony Awards for Best Book and Best Original Score out of nine nominations and six Drama Desk Awards. The show has a U.S. national tour and numerous professional and amateur productions in both the U.S. and abroad. The musical dramatizes the 1913 trial of Jewish factory manager Leo Frank, who was accused and convicted of raping and murdering a 13-year-old employee, Mary Fagan. The trial, sensationalized by the media, aroused anti-Semitic tensions in Atlanta and the U.S state of Georgia. When Frank's death sentence was commuted to life in prison by the departing governor of Georgia, John M. Slayton, due to his detailed review of over 10,000 pages of testimony and possible problems with the trial, Leo Frank was transferred to a prison in Milledgeville, Georgia, where a lynching party seized and kidnapped him. Frank was taken to Fagan's hometown of Marietta, Georgia, and he was hanged from an oak tree. The events surrounding the investigation and trial led to two groups emerging. The revival of the defunct KKK and the birth of the Jewish Civil Rights Organization, the Anti-Defamation League, ADL. Jason, um, Jason Robert Brown was, was brought on by Harold Prince um, after Stephen Sondheim turned the project down. Prince's daughter, Daisy, had brought Brown to her father's attention after she directed a production, I believe it was the last five years, no, um, a production of Songs for a New World for Jason Robert Brown. Um, Alfred Urey grew up in Atlanta, um, and had personal knowledge of the Frank story, as his great uncle owned the pencil factory run by Leo Frank. So, what do you think of the musical, Andrew? I think that it is a very dramatic and well-told story. I think you would agree. <laughs> yes, I 100% would. This is actually my favorite musical at this moment in time. Jess just loves the dark stuff, huh? You bet I do. And now... Let me make this statement that we have to do because um, this is about a true story. We are talking about the content of this musical alone as if it was divorced from the actual historical context. Because there is a lot of varied information about the trial of Leo Frank. And really, we have not enough clout to say anything whether or not it's true. All we do know is that he was posthumously um, pardoned 
due to the horrible way that his entire trial was managed. And it was um, basically a miscarriage of justice just because of the way that the trial was handled. Whether or not he was innocent or guilty, he was not given a fair trial. And that's all we're going to say about facts. Now let's talk about this musical. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, where do you want to start? Andrew, why don't you just give us a little beat by beat of what happens in this musical and uh, the tone and the ideas it's trying to convey. So basically it's Confederate Memorial Day, which I'm really hoping is not a holiday that exists anymore, but it probably it is. is. Yep. Uh, <laughs> uh, the America is the only country where we actively celebrate traitors. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when is uh, when is Benedict Arnold? Actually, you know what? I live near a, mon a monument to Benedict Arnold. Uh, two of them, in fact. When are we getting our Edward Snowden statue? You know, is there a musical about uh, Benedict Arnold? I'm just thinking about that. Lin Manuel Miranda, get on it. That would actually be a pretty good show if you've read anything about him. Uh, <laughs> I think it would be a very interesting subject to be a musical about. <laughs> it's Confederate Memorial Day, and you have this uh, Leo Frank from. Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn. Who's living, who, Brooklyn, who's living in the <laughs> South, um, which I, how he ended up there, why he ended up there, not really fully explained. Uh, he I'm ended assuming. up there because um, his wife's relative offered him a job working at the pencil factory as a superintendent. Okay. And he saw it as a good money. And as he says, like, I didn't realize it paid so well because I had to live in the South. <laughs> Um, his I thought his wife was from the South, though. She is, um, but I think they were arranged marriage type thing, it feels like. Okay, that's interesting. Huh. I wish they got deeper into any of that. I mean, it is a love story between him and his wife at the whole of this. That is the emotional yeah. through line of the show. But basically, he feels out of place, um, of course, with it being Confederate Memorial Day and he's a Yankee. Um, obviously, He has a great would. line. Um, who, um, Confederate Memorial Day is asinine. Who wants to celebrate losing a war? <laughs> <laughs> Say what you will about how dark this is. It has some pretty good laugh moments. But so he goes to his factory and this little girl, um, Mary Fagan. In. Yep. She comes in to get paid and then she dies. Um, and of course everyone blames it on him. There's this ridiculous trial that is just absolutely off the rails in terms of there's no evidence his lawyer doesn't even try uh i mean i'm not sure how accurate this is to reality Basically, of course but with reality um his trial lawyer it's really iffy because by design there's a reason why his trial lawyer do doesn't say much in the musical it's because what he did say was mostly racist oh so that's Against black people. Okay. I mean, that's actually probably a very effective defense in the South, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out in that time, they hated Yankees more than they hated black folks because they didn't just fight a war with African Americans. You also skipped over when they were trying to... When they found the body that he just starts stripping to his undies. The second act is mostly he's in prison and wants to get out of prison, obviously. And they eventually get to the... Before he gets hung by the yeah, neck. Yeah, they eventually get to the point where he's gonna get... A lighter sentence, which honestly is, in my opinion, still a massive miscarriage of justice to give him a life sentence for what that trial was, like how horrible that was. But whatever, they give him a life sentence instead and move him to like some minimum security farm or some shit. Um, and then he gets hung. <laughs> and that's the end. He gets lynched by a group of people. <laughs> but even the villains, even the villains that go out and lynch these people... Like, let's be fair. They think that he raped and murdered a 13 year old girl. It's not like they are. It's not like they're framing him because they just hate him. They're framing him because they honestly think he did it. Yes, but the reasons they think he did it are just crazy. And at the same time, he's also already being punished for whatever they think he did. I don't know. It's just it's just this vigilanteism. It's so depressing. <laughs> We have vigilanteism the, in the movies. Real life vigilanteism is not good. <laughs> like these folks call themselves like the guardians of Mary Fagan and that they eventually became the second reintroduction of the KKK in America and led to this mass exodus of Jewish people from the South. Like it, it this was a huge event. Now, I always thought that the KKK came back a lot because of um, 
birth of a nation. I'm sure that didn't hurt. Was that around the same exact time as this? It wasn't too far off. It was like a 10-year period. Yeah, because I still want to blame D.W. Griffith. <laughs> That was he actually... glorified the KKK. Like, I think he saw what the Knights of Mary Fagan were doing and was like, they, they, these gentlemen seem like they know what they're doing. Now, those gentlemen, they've got a strong head on their shoulders. <laughs> I love how this musical, like, reinterprets what is the musical theater structure. Like, at first, we see these, uh, Mary Fagan and this guy named Frankie Epps. And... and we get the setup of Leo and Lucille as the main couple. And as soon as we see them, we think they're going to be the secondary couple. We think they're going to be the um, Zanita and Tommy Zealus. They kind of are. Yes. Just one of them's dead. <laughs> and then, like, as soon as she's dead, he becomes hell-bent on getting revenge on whoever killed her. I actually feel like Frankie doesn't get enough, uh, like, enough time in the show. Why do you say that? I don't know. I just don't remember very many big moments from him except for the big I'm going to kill him number and then the actual end where he kills him. Like, I don't remember Spoiler that much alert, else. by the way. Spoiler alert for history. We've already spoiled the whole show. Like, what... <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think that he has a few moments peppered in. They, I think the Don Moore production that we watched that I think is the best production because the Broadway version was really messed up by a lot of bureaucracy and appealing to Hal Prince and all that. Um, yeah, the Broadway production is not that great, in my opinion. But either way, um, they dumbed down his character a lot, but they also made the show a little bit more nuanced by doing so. Was he more of a supervillain type before that? or Kind of more like a kid that's talked into being evil. And this one, he kind of has this goal and is kind of down with it from that point on. Well, I mean, it makes sense that he would absolutely despise Leo just because, you know, like he is the one who, well, one of the ones who is the most affected by it, obviously the mother more so who barely is in it, honestly. She has one scene and then disappears. Yep. <laughs> That's a good scene. It has a hell of an ending. It's hard to not see this musical as somewhat a response to the O.J. Simpson trial from 1995 that was like going on a little bit before this. Because once again, you also have people framing evidence using um, recent events as an excuse and all that. Like, it's hard to not see that connection. Did In, you feel that when you watched it? I did not, but honestly, I don't know very much about the OJ trial, because when that was happening, I was like a wee boy. And honestly, I haven't really gone back to look at OJ stuff. <laughs> it's a very intense story. Like, the ESPN did a very good Oscar-winning documentary about it. So if you're, I mean, there's you know, a lot to it, and I know that it's still kind of up for debate whether or not he, people think he did it. He did it. He did it. It's like the opposite of Leo Frank, where he didn't do it. Well, at least we're, according to the musical, he definitely didn't do it. I don't know much about But who did do it is the question. Because the musical doesn't point fingers either. They make it pretty obvious who did it. I mean, I would say. Who do you think did it? The Night Watchman guy. Like, he just doesn't have any excuses when they go and question him about it. It's like, uh, well, uh, uh, like, uh... <laughs> You know, it's it's like, okay. The Night Watchman guy, which one? Are you talking about the guy that said he told me to watch The Door, that song? Or the first one that's like, I'm trying to remember? Oh, I might have it backwards then. I'm talking about the guy they visit at the in the second act. That's who most people believe did it in real life, too. Yeah, because it's like, it seems pretty fucking obvious that he has no excuses and just is trying to stick to one story that he was not involved at all and I have no idea. <laughs> well, no, he's like, I was involved, I hid the body. I didn't oh, yeah. kill her, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's putting you at the scene of the crime at the time of the murder. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> that's a terrible alibi, even. <laughs> but there are still very many people, like, in the South, this is a very hotly debated issue. Like, the South hate Leo Frank. They see him as a symbol of everything wrong with the world. They are very 
much in the belief that he did it. Whereas Alfred Urey, who wrote the book and was like the main spearhead behind this, was like, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Why aren't you guys like talking about it? They're like, no, don't even bring that up. And I don't know if this is just because I've never fucking been there and I just get everything from the media, which obviously a lot of media folks like to spin things against the South. And I think this musical might be a demonstration of that a little bit in like making the South look like a bunch of ignorant hicks. But at the same time, like, I'm not sure. Is that true? I've never really been to the South. I don't really, I've never really talked to people from the South. So it's like, I have this disconnect where I don't really know how it really is down there. I mean, back then, even like, it seemed like a different country altogether because, you know, like there was a war and everyone's coming back together. Well, I mean, it kind of was, yeah. Even now it still feels like a different country in a way. Well, yeah, and that's why I kind of don't really know what people down there think. And what they really, what their opinions on things really are. And I know a lot of times they get spun because of the whole Civil War and the Confederacy and all that shit as being, they're all insanely racist and the North is not. Um, but at this time when this show was, at this time when this show was, like, I, there's a lot of things that say that the North was potentially even more racist than the South was in some ways. Um <laughs> I would like you to elaborate on that statement because I'm just interested. Well, I in... mean, racism isn't necessarily just I'm going to keep you as a slave, which obviously is incredibly racist. I'm not saying that it's not, uh, <laughs> um, but it's it's beyond that. Like, it's like how you look at different races. And in the North, uh, places like Boston were doing things where they weren't busing students to uh, proper schools and things like that. Uh, they were doing segregation without announcing it, essentially. Um, and the North could kind of get away with that and not look as racist to the South because the South was so blatant about everything. Right, so the South was, like, blatantly racist. And the North was doing the uh, the whole get-out racism, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I voted for Obama three times. Yeah, it's like... And that, I feel like that's kind of what Get Out is even about, so, like, that's why that yeah. movie is so relevant. Liberal it's about, racism. It's about it's about the northern racism. It's about like, hey, the South does this blatantly, but you guys are fucking doing this too. <laughs> well, it's kind of like uh, another musical that talks about racism in a very smart way. Um, as much as a lot of people think it's controversial, is the Scottsboro Boys. Um, there's a song called "That's Not the Way We Do It in New York," where this, like, do you know anything about the Scottsboro trial? No, I do not. It wasn't taught to you in school? Um, I mean, if it was, I don't recall. Basically, it's about these four boys who were accused of raping this girl. And there was no proof of that, but since it was the South, they basically... Oh, okay, yeah, I think, I think I've heard of this one, yeah. But either way, this um, New York lawyer comes up and he's like, well, that is not right. By gum, that is not the way we do it in New York. I see like these, they have the colored only signs. Just ask my maid Jemima how not racist I am. Ask my servant people how not racist I am. Yeah, and it's like, okay, so you don't have them as slaves, but they're all in these lower class. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and you see the media will spin things like the South is this horrible place where racism is still alive and well but it's like is it really so different though <laughs> I, I just don't i don't have that experience so i can't really say if this is like a, a a slander piece against the south or not well it's written by a southern man so, so i so have a, likely not then i want to tell you a little story about how jason robert brown came on the project because sondheim was originally approached and he said i just did passion i don't really want to do anything crazy serious again yeah so he um jason robert brown came on they were like all right here is the premise um just go to writing and he Jason Robert Brown looked up Mary Fagan's tombstone and it's like said something akin to like the Red Hills of Georgia. And he's like, OK, that feels like it rhymes. So he wrote um, the old Red Hills of home and Alfred Urey, who is a very southern man, just started weeping because it is such a good description of the patriotism of the people in the South and how they look on themselves. And yeah. I think that song is sincere, but it also is very, very sinister in a way. And we'll get into that further when we get to that song. The person who sings that song is one of the people in the whole lynch mob at the end, He's isn't it? a representation of the world we live in, in a way. 
So the show opens with a Confederate soldier um, in his teenagehood being sent off to war and being like, I go to fight for these old hills behind me and I will spill the blood of the North upon these hills. Who cares? Fuck them. Then he comes back and he's got one leg and he's old and he's embittered and he's lost the war and he's like, I still fight for these hills and I still know what this believes, this this area believes in. And that sets up this world. That is very much equally setting up the world as much as tradition is in Fiddler on the Roof. That sets up the ties between the North and the South, and where we stand after that, and how divided we are. Which is another reason why it's set at Confederate Memorial Day, to show that that is still a very much open wound for these people, and explains why they're more quick to blame Leo Frank for this. Sadly, it's still relevant today, it seems. Like, the North and the South don't fucking get along. No, and it's scary. And I think this show needs a revival, in all honesty. Politically speaking, at least most of this show is still pretty relevant, even though it's set and it's historically based, but, you know, it still seems relevant. Obviously not to the extent that this was at the time. Um, not at the time of writing, but at the at the actual trial, of course. But it's still pretty relevant today, like, story-wise. What did you think about the romance story between Leo and Lucille? Which basically is the emotional core of the story that isn't, like, the southern tie to their land. It's decent, but I think the thing that really ties the show together is more so the drama of the courtroom and the case than the actual the emotion between them, to be honest. I disagree. I feel like they're the real... They're, they're the arc, basically, because they... It takes going through all this emotional trauma for them to become an actually cohesive pair together. They don't, they are not able to talk to each other, but as soon as, like, he is thrown in jail and she is on the outside trying to secure his release in whatever way possible, they do finally fall in love. It is the guy meets girl scenario, except they've been married for a year, and they just weren't emotionally able to connect until that very last moment. No, yeah, I do understand that. It's just... Really, the intrigue of the show is not, oh, are they going to fall in love for me? The intrigue is all in the drama. Of the... I mean, the drama of the technicality, but I think we still need that emotional connection between those. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But I think it's it. I wouldn't call it what ties the show together, because if you cut all that out, it would still be a pretty interesting show. Um, whereas if you remove all the courtroom stuff and just have the love story, it would suck. <laughs> I disagree. I think a court uh, love story between this girl that isn't like in the first act, she's not convinced he didn't do it because she has to be convinced of it as well. Like when the reporter is like, you're saying he's a good guy. You're saying like he's emotionally open, but you're not saying he didn't do it. And then she's like, I don't have anything more to say. Like, that says a lot, and it shows the growth of, like, her doing whatever she can to secure his release because she knows he's innocent in the second act. Yeah. Like, there's growth there, whereas in the trial, yeah, there's a change, but there's no real growth or emotional depth there. I don't know. I, I look at it as a courtroom drama, like uh, like a crime. Like, if this was a movie, it would be a crime procedural show. Like, that, that'd be what I want out of it, because I think that that's how it works best. I mean, that's effective, but I don't think it's the best part. Well, I disagree. <laughs> what do you think of Leo Frank as a character? Because he is a really... Really hard to like person. Really? I don't see him as that difficult to like. He's a difficult man. <laughs> I think he makes some weird decisions, and um, I think that he is a little bit distant from a lot of people, but I think that it's justified because of where he is and how he's feeling about everything. And Even especially like the, the disconnect shit that from his wife, him. though? The disconnect from his wife is coming from the fact that she is from the South and he's not. So it's like she's at home and he isn't, and he's disconnected from the world that she's in. Like, she wants to go to the Confederate Memorial Parade, and he's like, why the fuck would I want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, basically, she is part of that world, and so he's disconnected from that world. He's disconnected from her. Yeah. Um, any other characters you want to talk about? What do you think of the governor, Jack oh, Slayton? Uh, well, the governor really comes in the second act, mm -hmm. and he's kind of the guy that, like, saves the day a little bit. Or Not does really. his best. He does his best. I think the the other person that would be interesting just to talk about is just the uh, the prosecutor who is 
Gorsi. obviously, yeah, just like obviously over the top, and for some reason, like way, like looking for a conviction, like way more than you'd expect. He was told he had to get one. I yeah, but it's like he didn't have the evidence to support it, and it feels like he was being a bit scummy about it. And a lot of the evidence he brings is like falsified, and the testimonies circumstantial are circumstantial and all that. Yeah, and it's like. You know, that's very scummy. He's not a good guy. Yeah, he is, and but you still understand him. Like, he honestly believes that Leo Frank did this, and he's just trying to get a murderous rapist in jail. So on that side, like, let's imagine the, his point of view, where he just sees this guy, and he's like, I don't care. I need him dead. But if you look at it from his perspective, he also knows that all the evidence he's bringing to the table isn't true, or at least is highly exaggerated. Means to an end, sir. Means to an end. Yes, but if you are if you know you have to exaggerate things just to actually get the conviction, then wouldn't the conviction not be something you'd actually believe in? <laughs> You're talking all Mark Furman talk at me. I'm he basically I'm... is an equivalent for Mark Furman, for those who know the OJ case. Mark Furman is the defendant? He was the cop that allegedly faked a bunch of evidence because he hated black people. I mean, that's not unbelievable. He mucked up that entire trial and avoided their... I'm not going into the OJ trial. Look it up, you guys. OJ time. Jess, I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to have to do the mid-show announcement. Jess is horribly sick with uh, liver illness. Kid kidney stones. He has kidney stones. Um, but we are going to do that mid-show announcement. Check this out. Today's show, uh, you could probably do this by heart, but today's show is brought to you by Audible. And Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. You just have to go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese um, and you can browse the unmatched selection of audio programs and even download a title for free and start listening. It's seriously that easy. You just go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese, and you can just listen to whatever book you want. It's, it's well, as long as it's on there, of course. Uh, why Audible? Well, it's because Audible has a lot of books, has a lot of shows, has news, comedy, etc., etc., and you could just go on there and listen. Uh, now I'm going to have Jess, uh, Jess is back from his kidney stone, so we're going to have Jess recommend a book. What would you recommend? This week we're recommending An Unspeakable Crime, The Prosecution and Persecution of Leo Frank by Elaine Marie Alfin, narrated by Kevin Orton. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese for your free audiobook. Did you hear me scream as I was pushing out that kidney stone? It really I... hurt. I was really trying not to listen to it, but, like, it sounded like it was at least big. I cried, and there was a lot of blood. Oh, no. I mean, yeah, that'll happen. <laughs> All right, guys, let's get back to the show. The lives that we live when the Southland was free. Let's talk about the old Red Hills of Home, which is one of my favorite opening numbers of all time. I think this is a very good song. But? <laughs> I don't think it works that... Well, I mean, it works as an opening number, but it doesn't set anything up at all. It's almost like a standalone song. Like, you could just listen to this song and without any context whatsoever, and it's pretty good. And it still would make sense. I think it works very well as an opening number because it sets up the tension between the North and the South. It sets up the location for two. It sets up how everyone's, like, um, uh, moral obligation to their sit their not their city, to their state of Georgia, as well as everything it represents, as well as the reason why you'd understand why they turn against Leo Frank so fast. They, It's us versus them, basically. I, I, Yeah, I can see that. And it also shows how close this was to the Civil War. If you, if you attach the song that comes immediately afterwards, I think it works really well as an opening number as well. Because that one sets up the modern day tension and everything and like how it's still being remembered. Um, whereas the actual Old Red Hills song is about tension during the uh, Civil War, which is a little bit different. It isn't, though, is the thing. It 
it shows that people who fought in the Civil War and despise these people, like, are still alive, still r- revered. Yes. They were soldiers. And then at the end, we have a different type of soldier. At the end, these soldiers that talk about fighting for the old Red Hills of home are the KK fucking K. And that is who are fighting for these hills. And that is what fighting for their country and their their state means. Did they mention the KKK in the show? No, but... I don't remember that. Frankie Epps at the end says, I go to fight for the old hills of Georgia. And that is what he's referring to. I am going to fight against everyone that we hate in this state. Because fuck them, it's us versus them. And just showing how this entire plot drove that to happen. No, it's a great song. I think it's good. This is probably one of the best songs in the show. Yes, and for, like, Jason Robert Brown's first musical for a Broadway, like, the first notes to ever play a Broadway stage written by Jason Robert Brown, who was in his 20s, this is a fucking masterpiece. It's very good, and he is probably the top talent on Broadway right now. Number one, absolute best. Savior of writing, don't you know? Savior of writing. I mean, he wrote a show where half of it is in reverse. (laughs) Can you imagine how difficult of an undertaking that would be to write a show where some of the timeline is backwards? Like, oh my goodness, the amount of pure genius. This man, his head must be this big, fucking giant, to hold the brain of a genius. The thing is, I like all of his songs. (laughs) Like, I talk shit about him, but I do like his songwriting. It's pretty good. I mean, compared okay. to, like, Andrew Lloyd Webber, he's, like, head and shoulders. I don't know. I mean, you got, like, the Rum Tum Tugger song. <laughs> you got Mr. Mistopheles. I mean, that's a good one. Memory! <laughs> <laughs> These people make me tense. I live in fear they'll start a conversation. These people make no sense. They talk and I just stare and shut my mouth. It's like a foreign land I didn't understand that being Southern's not just being in the South When I look out on all this, how can I call this home? Let's talk about how can I call this home, which is Leo Frank's I Want song, basically. This is very good, too, thematically. Musically, yes. it's not super memorable, but it's it's pretty good thematically. It's set against the parade, the Memorial Day parade, as he's just yes. trying to get to work. And they're, like, singing around to me. He's like, what is wrong with you, people? What's wrong with you? I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. And he's just like, these people, like, even the Jewish people aren't, like, Jewish people. I thought the Jews were Jews, but I was wrong. I like how he interacts with the environment around him, how distant he is from it. Mm-hmm. And how this song is encapsulates that perfectly right and it's not he doesn't talk down to them really like he's like this is just different and he's not dismissive but it's just like i don't fit in here well, i mean a little bit he does have the line that you mentioned earlier who celebrates losing a war which <laughs> obviously is a little bit dismissive of everything they're celebrating but <laughs> he's dismissive of the idea of what they're celebrating not the fact that they the people individualize he's not like these dumb hicks yeah which is what i said I think it's a really good, like, very smart I Want song. It's quick, it's fast, it's not like him turning to, like, the audience being like, I wish I had adventure out there. I just want to count my money. I just want to count my money because I'm greedy and I hate the South. (laughs) (laughs) I find it interesting that Sondheim was originally approached for this musical because I'm trying to think of how he would write write and structure the songs in this. I'm sure it would have been better. Really? You think it would have been better if Sondheim did it? Of course. Sondheim is gold. Everything he touches is gold. (laughs) Someone just agreed with me. Someone in the audience just agreed with me. I don't know. Um, I don't like the frogs that much. So. The frog is that kind of like cats? Um, kind of, but no. I had an idea for a musical where it's cats, but they're frogs, and all the frogs have silly names, and then you just sing a song about one frog, and he'll leave, and then another frog comes in, and you sing a song about that frog. I don't think it'll work. <laughs> I don't think it'll work. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, go on, go on, and bet your mama let you take you to the picture show. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. But you weren't really listening when I said no. When I asked, I own the snowbird. Her mama lets her do whatever she wants. I was hoping I could go with you. Cool, you've got a 
to talk about Mary and Frankie getting introduced. All right, let's talk about the picture show. So how old is Frankie in this show? I think he's around 15, like mid-teenager. Okay. Am I wrong? This song is basically he wants to fuck her and the mother says no? Yeah. It's creepy. It really is a creepy she's 13, song. right? Yeah, she's a child. Yeah, so is this setting up for us that we're not supposed to like Frankie? Because Frankie's like, oh, he's like a weird sex pervert. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I think this is meant to be? What? Do, have you... Oh, that's a bad reference. To, that's that's a bad framework to put this as. Uh, okay. Let me think for a second of a way to phrase this. Fuck it, I'm going to go with my original thought. Have you ever had a classmate die in school? When I was at my graduation, I found out that one of my classmates had died, and I didn't even know him. Every year of my school year, there was a different person from my class that died, and every time, there was this one girl that tried to claim she was the best friend of that person and get all the attention from it, when I, it was obvious she never met them before. It is a good strategy, though, to go up the social ladder, you know, you gotta claim that you knew this person. It's horrible. It's like Dear it really is shit. But where it's better is if you enter that family's home and then sleep with their sister. <laughs> And I think that's kind of what Frankie is doing, nevertheless. This shows that, like, yeah, they vaguely knew each other, but he wasn't, like, her best friend. He was just, she was just one of many girls he was trying to get to make out with him, basically. Yeah, so really, this does kind of undercut the whole Frankie's super mad because, oh my goodness, she was my, my best friend ever a little bit. So it kind of makes him more of that villain type where it's like he really just wants to kill somebody. He's out for blood. <laughs> <laughs> he's out for blood and pussy, nothing else. Yeah, because it's like you have this song where basically he's just like, man, I'd really like to fuck that girl. Uh, and then she dies and he's like, she was my best friend in the whole world and I want to kill whoever did it. If she hadn't died, she would just be a girl I once knew. Essentially. The only thing that made her important to him was the fact that she died. Yes. And that's even shown when he has this whole song about like, hey, come to the picture show with me. He's like, why don't you ask Iola? And he's, she's like, he's like, oh, no, I want to go with you. And she's like, all right. Then as soon as she's off stage, he's like, hey, Iola, want to go to the pictures with me? Yeah. So Frankie is a bad dude. And this song sets that up, too. Frankie's a fuck boy. He's a fuck boy, and you don't trust fuck boys because they will hang your murderer. Hang someone that was <laughs> accused of your murder, but not really your murderer. But was convicted of it. Was convicted and charged, yep. Yep, that's why you don't hang around fuck boys, because they will do that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the funeral song, There's a Fountain and It Don't Make Sense. Another Frankie song, Frankie the Fuckboy. You take what you learned from Picture Show and you're like, oh, okay, he's just kind of making all this up, isn't he? <laughs> I mean, at the same time, he probably cares a little bit. Well, like, it's kind of like the trauma of like, wow, I, it's what was lost and all that. and like, Yeah. But it's real. it makes it worse when you know he's talking to the press about this, mostly. Yeah. Because it's like he's basically getting interviewed and he's like, oh, man, it doesn't make sense that I'm not going to see her anymore. And oh, it's so sad. Like she was so cute and I liked her and she was nice. Yeah. So it just it's Dear Evan Hansen, but in 1910 times. In fact, I, I'm kind of wondering if Frankie was supposed to be a red herring. Like you think that maybe he did it. No, I don't think he there, he didn't do it. <laughs> no, no, but I'm wondering if that was the intention of the picture show song. No, the intention of the picture show song is essentially to make you think this is going to be a usual classic carousel musical where you got the main couple and the secondary couple, in my opinion. I suppose. It's more teasing that and being like, haha, fuck you. Aha, subverted. <laughs> I mean, this musical does subvert your expectations. Like, the opening number is sung by a solo guy that's really passionate. It's literally about murdering um, the northern soldiers so that they have the right to have slavery. And yeah. then they do it again in the beginning of Act 2, and they do it with the secondary couple thing. Like, this, sh 
It's all about subverting your expectations. This is The Last Jedi, the musical. It really is. <laughs> Meaning it is my favorite. Jess's favorite Star Wars movie is The Last Jedi as well. It, it, it is. Second is that actually Empire. true? Yes. I've never even watched it. It's really good. I like it a lot. I, I, I gotta say, everything I've seen about like Luke and everything looks terrible, but it's your favorite, so you can... Then you don't know this man I don't think you could You don't have the right to know A man that was and good He is a decent man He is an honest man And you don't know Okay, now we can talk about You Don't Know This Man. Now, this is the song that Lucille sings when basically she's berated with a bunch of folk asking, like, do you think your husband did it? Did he murder that girl? And he, she's like, no, you don't know who this is. And she's like, he pays his bills every... He writes his mom, like, he's a good man. And it basically... This is just her saying that uh, he's good and she can't bring herself to say that he didn't do it, though. Yeah, that's kind of the thing. And uh, it really sets up in so many words like her stance on everything yeah i think it's it's definitely very good for the romantic subplot basically it just sets up where she stands and then you have the arc of her going from that to i she definitely didn't do it and i don't believe that he did it at all mm -hmm. and like she's even considering not going to the trial because she doesn't want to deal with all the shit well that she straight up says she's it. not going to doesn't she she says she, she's not going to, but then she still goes. Yeah, she does end up going, but she at the end of this song, she has said str strictly she's not going to. Right. And I don't blame her. That sounds horrible. It was pretty horrible, too. That trial mm -hmm. was a fucking mockery. <laughs> but what do you have anything to say about this song altogether? Not really. I mean, it's just... I like it mostly because for female musical theater songs, you don't really get to do something this specific. How do you mean? Like most female songs are about like my boyfriend left me or I'm in love. And this one's like, my husband is not the horrible murderer man that you think he is. And I'm like, all right, I haven't seen that very much in a musical solo. I guess. I just appreciate it because it's like, this is different than most female solos on Broadway. It's still about love, but yeah. <laughs> It isn't, though, because I feel like she doesn't love him right now. But that's what it's about. It's more about, like, what he does in the same way that, like... It's a showing that she doesn't love him, at least not fully. It's more like, yeah, he's a good man. He does all these things that good people do, right? That means he's good, right? Yeah. It's Looking basically, for confirmation in a way. It's basically her screwing him over so eventually he dies. <laughs> This song well, directly leads to his death. Come on! Why don't you come up and come on, come up to my? Why don't you come up and come on, come up to my? Why don't you come up and come on, come up, come on, come up, come on, come up, come on, come up, come up and come on! This is a fun one. I fucking love the song, dude. Yeah. Um, this is where he gets off the he gets off the bench and starts he's doing what they say he did. Basically, these four girls describe Leo Frank in a way that she they were coached to do as this sexual maniac that calls him up to their office and tries to rape them basically on a daily basis. And in this we have like a theatrical representation of it and the actor playing Leo Frank has a chance to act like the horrible monster that they're portraying, which... Oh, he, and he hams it up. It's great. It is great, and it is upbeat, but it also is so dark and depressing. I think that's the best type of uh, song in these, like, more serious stuff, which is why I think Sweeney Todd works so well, as you have all those upbeat songs about horrific things. And I think like that if you're going to do this type of dark musical, that's the best way to handle it. And you think this handles it well where it has like the juxtaposed, like really upbeat, like come up to my office. This song nails it like this is there. I wish there was more of this song in the show, but there's not. I think in act one, they have a lot of it. Act two, it kind of gets more straight serious. 
All right. Um, I also like the vocal mixing of the four ladies, like the four young girls, like when they started, like he'll call my name and it becomes around. It is, it, it sets up that it's like coached very well by having them all say the exact same thing. And then going into the flashback, like it is so perfectly constructed. Like as much as I love old red Hills of home, I think this one as a storytelling piece works the best. This song basically sums up the entire trial. Like, they have a bunch of songs making up the trial, but I feel like you could cut all of them except this one and it would still work perfectly. I'm going to disagree with you because we got the next song we got to talk about. You don't understand. She didn't want to play the game, and so I went and hit her. You see, I had to hit her. He told me I should go and look. He said she's acting like she's sick. And I said, Lord, that child is dying. That's what I said. And he said, no, no, it ain't my fault. That girl is dead. He said, no, no, that's what he said. That's what he said. He said, no, no. And his eyes were wild and his face was red. He said, no, no, no. That's what he said. That's what he said. That's what he said. That's what he said by Jim Conley. I love this song. This is like another like really upbeat, dark, demented song. No, this is the one where he's like this guy was coached as well. And he just makes something up where he's Frank was there and he did the whole thing and told him to watch. Yes. And he helped kill him in order to get a commuted sentence for like being an escaped convict and all that. Yeah. And in reality, they like to think that he is the one that actually killed Mary Fagan instead of Leo Frank, Jim Conley. And this one is probably the most frustrating because it's like he's just straight up making everything up. It's like Mm -hmm. and nobody calls him on it. Uh, Yeah. This is a very frustrating part to watch, honestly. It is, but also the song is so catchy. <laughs> That's the worst part is like, it is such a catchy, dark, demented song about taking a little girl's body and hiding it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never touched that girl. You think I'd hurt a child yet? I'd hardly seen her face before I swear, I swore We'd barely met These people try to scare you With things I never said I know it makes no sense but I like Leo's statement. Leo's statement song. is really depressing and, I feel and like great. This is the one that's like the most emotional in the whole show, I think, personally. But I'm more tied into the whole courtroom plot, so you probably think the one with Leo and Lucille is better. Um, yes, in a way. I think this is a very emotional point and Leo's only solo number in the entire show, believe it or not, which is strange. Is it really? It's the only one where he doesn't have anyone else involved be it the townspeople or his wife or anything like that i guess that kind of makes sense and originally in act two jason robert brown wrote this song called i have something to say i have something to say i have ways to hear quiet and follow the game with the mobs running riot and cursing by name dumbly wondering why it's been me who's to blame but i see would just be like i i didn't do it and all that but they wisely cut that out because they really wanted to focus more on the wife's um trials and tribulations in act two i mean i feel like that makes sense because the show is less about leo himself and more about everyone else's reaction to him but this is like the one time he gets to actually say something and maybe people will listen and of course they don't (laughs) of course yeah it's got really depressing lyrics like i never touched that girl You think I'd hurt a child yet? I'd only seen her face before. I swear I swore we'd only met. These people try to scare you with things I never said. Like, very emotionally driven lyrics. And it just makes you really sad because you know that literally no one's going to listen to him and immediately following the song, they declare him guilty. I want to say that I was expecting the subversion uh, of he just dies 
right after that song. <laughs> Because and Act 2 just, is about something completely different? I was literally expecting them to cut from the courtroom scene to him getting hanged. That's what I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> but nope, we got the little bit of hope in Act 2. I can tell you this as a matter of fact That the local hotels wouldn't be so packed If a little black girl had gotten attacked Go on, go on, go on, go on They're coming, they're coming now, yes sirree Cause a white man gonna get there's a black man swinging in every tree, but they don't never pay attention. They'll never say why, why, why. But if a Yankee boy flies, surprise, 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 they don't pay attention. Rumbling and a Rolling, I think, is a really smart song, and I've ta- I talk about musical theater structure way too much on this show, but I've said it before. The opening of Act 2 should have nothing to do with the main plot of the rest of the musical. It should be kind of a sit down, get your bearings, figure out, because no one ever no one ever takes two dumps. They, <laughs> I did. They always come in in the middle of the first song in Act 2 and be like, what did I miss? Um, So the first number of Act 2 should really have nothing big to do with the plot. But you can't really have like a fun dance number at the beginning of Act 2 after you just have your main character sentenced to murder. So what do they do? They have two um, members of the African-American community in the South give their thoughts on the proceedings. Which is basically like, the yeah, Leo Frank's about to get hung. That is our everyday fucking life. And it is another subversion of expectations because it's basically taking everything that we were emotionally invested in in Act 1 and reminding us like, yeah, you think that's bad? That's us every single day. Um, Yeah, another white man's going to get hung? Great. There's a black man hanging in every tree, but ain't nobody going to pay attention. Um, yeah, the- I kind of hate this song because Fuck you. of that. <laughs> Let, let me finish. Like, another line is like, um, I can tell you this as a matter of fact that the local hotels will never be so packed if a little black girl had gotten attacked. Like, it's basically setting up like, you only give a shit because it's white people and that's the only reason why we even know this story. And I get what you're saying where it isn't connected and it's criticizing everything, but I feel it like... It undermines we- the entire first act, and you even said it, but I... It- it does, and I don't think it's a good thing. I think that's... I think it's a good thing. We didn't need to be reminded of that. There's plenty of other media that discusses this topic. We don't need it in this show. But race is an inherent part of this story, especially with the fact that Jim Conley is where a lot of people tried to place the blame on this murder, who is a black man. But he's also, according to this musical, probably the person who did it. <laughs> so, I feel like, like it's <laughs> an elephant in the room, and they did the smart thing by addressing it fully. I... Don't feel and they did way. it in the right place. I mean, if this was just in the middle of Act 1 or in the middle of Act 2, it wouldn't fit. But the fact that we open right up, we get a different viewpoint on what we just saw. I just don't think we needed it, and I think it does undermine... Like, you have this big emotional moment from Leo, and then right afterwards they're basically like, well, yeah, but black people do that all the time, so, like, his big emotional moment, like, who gives a fuck? Like, all black people have to do with that, so fuck you. <laughs> I mean, the show altogether is about miscarriage of justice, and... Absolutely. Yeah, miscarriage of justice isn't limited just to Leo Frank. I agree, but this story is about Leo Frank, so that's who we should focus on. But America is more than just the whites and the, the white Jews and the white Southerners. I completely agree, but this story is about Leo Frank... And he's a white shoe. <laughs> and I'm just saying, getting another opinion on that doesn't hurt nothing. Nope, and I can get that opinion in any other show. And also, you have a lot of African-American people that have a story. Like, you have his maid, you have um, Newt Lee, you have Jim Conley. And also, you kind of yes. want to give them more than just being background players. So, giving them their own song as well as also helpful in the old together making this a round musical. Okay, I mean, that's fine. I don't, like, absolutely despise this song. It's just, I think it's an odd political statement to make when that message is really, it kind of undermines the story that they're telling. Which is, like, you don't want to have, like, a line of dialogue in your movie that basically takes all of the plot of the movie and is like, 
oh, well, you think that's bad? You should have seen what happened to me last Thursday. And then just not even mention that. <laughs> like, okay. I will say that it sets up the environment <laughs> of where we are in Act 2 well as too because it's also like okay everyone's piling in and everyone's coming down from the north like to talk about leo frank like this isn't normal but then again no one gonna do this shit for us it is both narratively setting up a lot of plot as well as having a comment and something to say but you did also just say that the first number of the second act should not set up a lot of plot I'm saying it does, but we also get that set up and do it alone. Like, we kind as well as pretty music with Slayton. Yeah, I mean, it's fine. I just, I don't know. I, I disagree with throwing in a political message that contradicts the rest of the show. This is not over yet is possibly the highest emotional positive in the entire show. What about the part where they kind of won a little bit, like at the end? I mean, this took it from the very bottom and brings it up. I like it when, it, you know how in the end of the first Muppet movie when they think they haven't won anything and then they go out the door and they're like, oh, everyone's here. Yeah. I'm thinking of the Muppets 2011, not the first Muppets movie. Um, it's like that. It's like you, he thinks he's going to die and there's no hope. And then he gets the call saying that the governor is looking into his case and he's like, oh my God, like the Reaper isn't coming for me. Like the hangman's not coming for me. There is hope and it's all because of my wife and I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. And we need this. We need this moment. Like this moment you grab onto, like it's the ledge to pull you back on. Yeah. Yeah. And then they let you go. I mean, they make you feel it for a bit. Like, then basically we're re-looking at everything in the court case from Act 1 and being like, nope, that's bullshit. Nope, that's bullshit. And it is cathartic to get those, like, checked off and being like... Yeah, it's uh, it's good. I mean, I like the whole plot. I think the plot is great. I love the story of this. It's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about this song altogether? Like this? No, I don't really have... Honestly, most of these songs serve their purpose but there's not really much in terms of this is one of those musicals where they don't have songs that are like singable there's not really much I you look at me and you know I can sing every fucking song in this musical okay yeah I mean you can sing anything if you listen to it a hundred (laughs) times like I've listened to these songs one time when I watched it and I listened through the soundtrack one more time before we recorded this episode Um, so I've listened to them twice and I can sing, like, a few lines from Old Red Hills, and that's about <laughs> it. Wasted Time is, I think, the best song between Leo and Lucille. I agree. Um, it also is a good scene, if that makes sense. Like, yes. the scene around it, where they're having a picnic and this all that. This is the ending that you want them to have, and then they rip it away from you right afterwards. Like, they consummate their marriage, and I don't think they've ever had sex up to this point. Is like, that true? Holy shit. He couldn't even say the word procreate in Act 1, and, like, yeah, they you're bang right, you're in right. the prison here, and I'm like, all right, all right, all right. And it's just such an appreciation song. Like, he's basically talked down to his southern wife this entire musical, and here he's like, look at you. How could I have not been in love with you? What kind of fool could have taken you for granted for so long? Like, And really, it represents him falling in love with the South. <laughs> 
<laughs> no. No, 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 no. Well, you don't think so? No. Well, why is she... I mean, she's Southern. At the beginning, they're distant. And he hates the South, and he doesn't like her. And then she comes to him, and now, symbolically, that's him falling in love with the South. I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> Okay. The very next scene is him getting lynched, so nope. Maybe he liked it. I like being choked. He probably didn't like it. <laughs> no, I'm willing to bet he didn't like it. I mean, this really what this show ends with is uh, the audience is sad, the audience is angry, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, they confirm that he didn't do it, because they kind of left it up in the air until that very last moment. Because there is the moment early on in the musical where um, Mary Fagan comes to see Leo Frank and she's like, Mr. Frank, and then they cut from that scene into like um, the police knocking on his door. And then here we get that scene again, and instead of saying nothing and cutting away, she just gives him a windmill and says, Happy Memorial Day, and leaves. Yeah. Which is where this maybe separates from history a little bit, because we don't really mm -hmm. know... What Historically, happened? we don't really know what happened. Right. Whereas this is like, no, he definitely didn't do it. This musical is 100% convinced he didn't do it. Yeah, which, honestly, from what I know about the historical case and everything, just from brief research, seems pretty plausible. Um, it's plausible, but not <laughs> un confirmed enough where I can say here or there, and I've been criticized on in the past for like siding with the musical altogether, so... I'm sure there are some nuances that are completely left out of this. You can like Leo a bit more because mm -hmm. obviously if there's any potential that he did it, there's kind of like a, well, <laughs> right. Um, but even if he did do it, this ending scene is totally unjustified and mm -hmm. a miscarriage. It's a of lynching justice. vigilante justice and horrible. Yep. And which, which is more yeah. or less the point of why this is wrong more than like, he didn't do it. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, it's not a, you know, he didn't do it story. It's a story about uh, just how bad this sort of thing was. Mm -hmm. um, did you notice that his song Shema, um, the Shema basically is the Jewish um, prayer that you say when you believe you're about to die, um, is the same melody of Old Red Hills of Home? I don't think I noticed that, no. So his call to, like, his religion, his culture, is the same call that they have to their their culture and their belief system, which I thought was, like, a really smart way to lead into the finale as well. That is smart. But Lucille believes that Leo is free with God after everything, so there is that bit of hope. No. And the Confederate Memorial Day keeps going on in the backdrop of Dorsey, the man who pretty much got Leo Frank in prison and was part of the Knights of Mary Fagan, uh, taking Jack Slayton's place as governor of Georgia. And Lucille is trapped in this state that killed her husband and hates her kind. Yeah. Why did she not leave? Because Georgia is her home. But like it wasn't always. It seems like she moved there recently. No, she's a southern girl. Yeah, but, like, she did live in the north at some point. <laughs> she's left before. <laughs> and it ends on such a dark reprise of the opening number, and they're talking about fighting, and it's it's such a bleak ending, and I love yeah. it. <laughs> it's, yeah, I don't know. It's It just makes me a little angry, but I think that's the intention. You're here by the door. And you're holding my arm And you're stroking my hair And you're finally Mr. Frank What is it? Happy Memorial Day I go to fight for these old hills Behind me, these old red hills of home. I go to fight for these old hills. Remind me of a way of life that's pure, of the truth that will endure in this. 
city of Atlanta in the old red hills of the old So Andrew, what is your overall thoughts on Parade and your cheese rating? Overall, the story is fantastic. Um, if you want something that is going to have a lot of really fun musical numbers, you probably shouldn't be watching this. Um, <laughs> it's a it's a serious musical. It's one of those, um, which I always deduct points for that. How dare you take <laughs> yourself seriously? Honestly, though, like for real, you know, I I'm out here for a fucking fluffy piece to release all my bluesicles you know what i'm saying (laughs) (laughs) andrew Uh, wants every show to be she loves me i kind of do (laughs) (laughs) i like the story a lot in this and it's very nice and it's very serious and it's i i appreciate that um but it just doesn't have the fun that i want but i can understand why you'd like it a lot and it's definitely of the serious musicals we've watched, this is probably one of my favorites. As far as cheese rating, is there a distinctly southern cheese? Because I don't really know of one. I got mine. All right. Well, I'll let you go with that then. What's your thoughts? Um, Parade is one of my favorite musicals of all time. Currently, it's like my number one, but that changes week to week. But um, Jason Robert Brown has never been as good as he was in this musical. And it's so baffling that this was his first Broadway musical ever. Um, I can understand why he got so big headed from it. Um, The original Broadway production is a bit of a mess, but the original Broadway cast album is pretty good. Um, The Don Moore Warehouse album is very good as well because it is very complete. It has every line of dialogue and such. So if you want the full story, I recommend you give that a listen. And my cheese rating is Solgini cheese, which is specifically made in Georgia, where the old red hills are. (laughs) I'm just going to stick with whatever Jess said for cheese rating because I don't know any southern cheeses. (laughs) So I got nothing on that. (laughs) Well... You know what? Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Fucking... And Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese. Thank you guys for listening. Um, please follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, at Musicals with Cheese. Leave us a review. We're going to give out another iTunes gift card. We need more reviews. Just review us. Tell your friends to review us. Yes. Yes, please. <laughs> follow us on Twitter, at Cheesy Musicals. We're on Patreon, at Musicals with Cheese. We have a Cats commentary, and we just released a commentary on The Music Man, made in 2003 with Matthew Broderick. Um, we haven't recorded it yet, but I'm sure it's hilarious. It's up there right now, though. Um, our Instagram is Musicals with Cheese. Give us a follow. Send us a like and all that. Our YouTube page is Musicals with Cheese, and there's a brand new YouTube video up there right now, so check that out. Oh, our yeah. email is MusicalTheaterLives at gmail.com. Give us some attention tell us how you like us our title card was created by the amazing jolene casco follow her on instagram at jolene casco and you do want to talk about our affiliate link sure there's an amazon affiliate link in the description of all of our episodes if you're going to buy anything on amazon just click that link before you purchase and we'll get a portion of that at no extra cost for you um it's excellent just give it a click all right andrew is there anything else you want to say before we wrap up One more thing to kind of throw out there, I do want to say that the plot of this was pretty heavily ripped from My Cousin Vinny, Um, and it's a little bit upsetting to see something so blatantly stolen. Uh, So I do want to just say uh, that shame on you, Jason Robert Brown, for ripping off such a classic film. You know what I gotta say, Andrew? I go to fight for these old hills behind me, these old red hills of home. I go to fight for All right, these Yankee, old you're not allowed to sing this shit, okay? Me. You're not allowed to sing this, okay? Ready? For the song of our people. Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, we'll see you next time on Musicals with Cheese. Uh-huh.